Uh, no, I we moved uh, 2009 and kind of downsized. It's a nice, nice house, easy to maintain, and it's right near a trail that goes for. It's, <clears throat> but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. So get started? Yeah, let's start. All right, um, so welcome to our colloquium. So now um, today uh, we have Professor Rambat Hesling from uh, Stanford University. So, but uh, it's a uh, great pleasure to have you here, you know, as a, uh, you know, colloquium speaker. I really appreciate it. Um, so before uh, getting it started, let me uh, quickly introduce a uh, Professor Rambat Hesling. And he's a professor of uh, electrical engineering and applied physics at Stanford University. And uh, he has presented over 270 keynotes and invited presentations, also 80, uh, over 80 scientist meetings and published over 500 papers in scientific journals, over 15 book chapters, and editor of applied optics and applied science research and a triple E transaction on visualization. Okay, and he has over, wow, hundreds of patents, pending applications and issued worldwide. And he pioneered uh, 3D uh, optical data storage, a holographic data storage system. So demonstrating in world record performance uh, in 2000. So at that moment, I was uh, his student, he's my advisor, it's amazing. And also he built a first internet controlled laboratory in 1998. And also his group pioneered a field of topological matrix and tensor visualization techniques in uh, mid 1990s. So then also um, outside uh, academia, so he has founded three uh, startup companies and he was VP, CTO and chief scientist for a branded product at Western Digital. <clears throat> so then uh, he also is a member of Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Scientists and fellow of OSC and SPIE. And uh, uh, he studied uh, from Caltech as a Fulbright scholar. So then today, uh, Bart gonna talk about recent advances in differential phase contrast 3D X-ray imaging with application to medical imaging and aviation security. Okay, but uh, why don't you please get started? Well, thank you, Yuzuro, uh, for that introduction. And um, I uh, really apologize that I couldn't come to um, your university. I would say I looked uh, very much forward to, but um, I, I think under the current situation with the COVID-19, uh, it seemed like there was probably too much risk. Um, but anyway, I um, hope that maybe in a Zoom meeting that I can give you a um, impression of what we've been working on for the last uh, seven or eight years. And uh, so I will uh, do it that way. So the, uh, and the topic is, um, as Yuzuru already said, um, advances in differential phase contrast imaging. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the basic um, system, uh, the way it works and all of the um, uh, you know, kind of important issues that come up. Um, this was a um, effort that was funded by uh, TSA and DHS uh, for the application of uh, aviation security. So on the first page, what you see is the three phase. Um, so there were three according to uh, Greek mythology, uh, Clotho, the spinner. Um, then there was Lachesis, and uh, she was the allotter. And then there was Atropos, who was the inflexible. So these three women um, would decide um, at birth um, what the life of a child would be. And so um, I uh, was thinking about um, you know, what would be an appropriate name for um, the work that uh, we were involved in, and, and Yuzuru was part of that. Um, and I, so I called my uh, son, who is a uh, classical um, <clears throat> person with a lot of classical interest and background, and he said immediately, it was in about a few milliseconds, you've got to call it three phase, because what we will do is differential phase contrast imaging is uh, for aviation security. Um, we will actually measure three things, um, the absorption, uh, the phase, and the scatter. And so if all three of them are good, then you can actually fly. If it is not, then you cannot. So 
three phase to me and two others seemed like was a reasonable um, name to use. Uh, why does this not go forward? Let me do it this way. So um, this is my inspiration for lifelong learning. Um, I'm certainly at the university to uh, teach courses, but um, a lot of knowledge that I've gained over years um, were gained by um, students and uh, postdocs and uh, research associates and so on that worked in the group. Um, in this particular picture, Yuzuru is not in because it was taken a few years ago. Um, but it's been a uh, great pleasure uh, to work with all of these students and um, really a lot of credit should go to them. So a little bit of the background um, about uh, differential phase contrast imaging. And um, <clears throat> one of the um, important aspects of doing this is, as we all know, is if you want to do any kind of uh, interferometry, you need to have a uh, at least partially coherent source. And so Pfeiffer um, in 2006 in his group uh, essentially um, discussed uh, something that has also been in other places, but um, his papers essentially have had a lot of impact in the differential phase contact imaging community. And so on the left-hand side, what you have is an incoherent X-ray source. And there is an amplitude grading that makes it partially coherent. Um, the X-ray beam uh, passes through the object. Um, then there is a phase grading that essentially produces a Talbot imaging configuration. And then there is an amplitude grading um, that is movable perpendicular to the grading or parallel to the grading vector. And then there is an imaging detector. Now, <clears throat> The grading, the phase grading G1, um, there is not much that you can do about it. You always need that in the system, but the grade G0 and G2 are essentially due to the fact that there is not a really good source. And uh, unless you go to a synchrotron or so, which is not practical in, in a laboratory environment. Um, and then the amplitude grading is essentially there because the uh, resolution of the detector elements is um, much larger than what you can uh, utilize for uh, resolving the Talbot image. So um, the grading itself is characterized by um, a grading pitch, uh, P0 for G0, P1 for G1, and P2 for P2. And then we have a source of a certain width W. The uh, gratings are typically made out of uh, silicon and um, there's a gold coating on it. And so we see here G0, G1, and G2. Now, what you see is that um, these uh, cratings have a relatively high aspect ratio. And um, unfortunately, that causes some significant uh, impact on the field of view, which is very small. And I'll come back to that later. But the thing that made it exciting is that when you look at the transmission image, say, of the fish, and then you look at the differential phase contrast image, um, you see a lot more detail. And it's not just taking the gradient of that transmission, but there's actually a different type of measurement that is being made. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about how that system works and what kind of uh, um, different <coughs> improvements we have made. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, one thing that is important to know is that the um, gratings must be curved in order to be able to get a reasonable field of view. Um, and uh, even in that case, there are small uh, field of view on the order of centimeters. And there's a geometrical relationship between P0, P1, and P2. And uh, that relationship is also uh, determined by the distances between these different gratings. So we have an amplitude grading, um, G0, and we have a analyzer grading, and I'll talk about that, why we need it uh, in a moment, um, which is also a, um, a absorption grading, and then we have a phase grading. Now, one of the problems that this introduces is, as you can see, um, that uh, if you have a, a pitch roughly about um, um, half or a form factor that is roughly half, then um, you can lose half the power because that's absorbed in the absorbing areas in the gold. 
And, and that happens again in the analyzer. So you multiply one half by one half. And so what you got is only 25% transmission that goes on to the detector panel. So knowing the, um, the geometrical distances that you want to have, depending on where you place your object, this can be either to the right of the uh, one or to the left of it. Um, you then have to essentially design your gradings P0, P1, and P2 on the basis of these three equations that you um, um, see up on the uh, upper right-hand corner. So keep this in mind. And um, <clears throat> so, why is this not working all the time? Anyway, um, this is the um, three-phase DPC system as we built it at Stanford. Um, so the radiation source, um, Mr. Rat uh, cylinder is on the left. Um, that was a series of uh, X, Y, Z stages. Um, the object is on the three-dimensional space. It can be going up and down in the rotation and um, all uh, X, Y dimensions sideways. Um, then we have the gradings D0, D1, and D2. And then we have the um, detector source on the right-hand side. So in the case of doing CT, so uh, computer tomography, we place the object on the, um, <clears throat> on the table and um, we could put a, a small carry-on bag on there for the uh, TSA purposes uh, and experiments that we were carrying out. And the whole uh, equipment uh, area is enclosed in a uh, seven or eight millimeter thick uh, lead construction chamber. Um, so um, this whole system is isolated uh, at least for radiation leakage from the rest of the building and the lab. Now, why are we interested in this? Um, well, uh, together with uh, and several uh, colleagues of mine, um, uh, Fabian Peace and uh, Pianetta, um, we essentially um, worked on uh, imaging and tried to find out what would happen if you actually had apples and oranges going to a scanner at the airport. So the things that you see is in terms of the three um, data that you got, attenuation, DPC, and dark field. So DPC is typically referred to as the phase portion of it. And so in the terms of attenuation, um, the apple and uh, the orange don't look all that much different. There's not a whole lot that you can really discern either on the surface or on the interior. On the other hand, if you look at the face part of it, you see a lot of detail that comes in from the apple on uh, the coarse action area. And then um, <clears throat> you see that there is a lot more uh, delineation of the different areas in the apple. And if you look at the orange, we all know the orange has a lot of pockets. And uh, so those are essentially filled with fluid. And uh, that actually is uh, quite visible here. And if you look at uh, what is called the dark field, which is really a uh, small angle scatter, so it is different from, say, the Lowry scatter that um, you get if you look at x-rays going through a solid. Um, but you get always just on the surface, you see that this uh, spin of the um, orange, for example, is much different than it is from the apple, and you see all of the pockets that are inside. And in this case, um, that actually provides even more information as regards if the interior structure than the faces. So all three um, areas are very important. Um, so the three signals allow us to make a better recognition of what an object is. Now, one of the areas where we're all um, very familiar with this is, is that um, you, know, you can't really take liquids uh, above a certain size into your uh, carry-on bag in the airport. And the reason for that is pretty obvious as you look at this here. If you take uh, four bottles that we took, um, and uh, so we see here body wash, sanitizer, hand wash, and mouthwash, and put them in a bag. And um, then um, in this case, we're operating this, and I'll come back to that in a moment, at about 40 keV grading and, and about 160 kVp for the uh, uh, actual tube voltage. And so what you see is in, in attenuation, they all look identically the same. There is nothing really that distinguishes one fluid from the other. And so if you are now worried about uh, explosives and things of that sort, um, then this is an issue because you can't distinguish whether or not this is something that um, 
might produce um, a explosion on board of the aircraft. And so you just do not allow them to come in. On the other hand, though, if you um, look at the DPC signal, so first of all, you see a much more detailed um, outline of the bottles. But more importantly, uh, what you can find is, is that when you measure the actual um, real part of the uh, index of fraction, then these different liquids is all have a different number. So 2.75, 2.83, 1.7. And, and um, so at a resolution of one times 10 to the minus seven or better, every liquid that we've measured, including tea, coffee, wine, et cetera, um, have a different uh, combination of absorption and phase. And so if you then actually uh, look at also the dark field part of it, you can look and see whether or not there's anything that looks like powdery in there. And so you have now the ability to have a three-dimensional space in which you can then distinguish these different um, liquids from each other and from other materials. And so we can see, for example, fabric. And uh, so it's clear that at least in principle, you would expect that um, there would be more information obtained from making these three measurements as opposed to just the attenuation. And so the one of the way that we looked at this is was kind of looking at false alarm. So uh, a false alarm comes up is when one of the uh, machines in the airport where you put your bag into it, essentially measures something that looks like an explosive. Uh, for example, um, this could be um, uh, C4 or it could be something else, TNT. And uh, unfortunately, there are a, a significant number of things that look identically the same in absorption only. Um, and so what you see here is, for example, water, balsamic, honey, iron, molasses, toothpaste, and dough. These are all things that um, produce false alarm rates. And so when you have this stuff in your bag, um, the system cannot distinguish that from um, serious uh, combustible materials and explosives. But if you take this as a three-dimensional um, space and look at the independent measurements, and I'll show you why they are independent, then what you can do is, is you can essentially get clustering. And so you see that two space is different from ketchup and water and balsamic. And so when you plot the log of the phase, the absorption and um, the dark field, then we could essentially have areas in here where um, they are separated. And so when you take cross sections to these, what you see is in the absorption versus phase, for example, that um, where there is enormous overlap in this absorption histogram on the upper left hand side, um, this gets pulled apart. And um, so when we do that, we can essentially now find um, where all these um, materials are reside in three dimensional space. Now, of course, um, you can apply to this um, you know, machine learning models. And um, so we did that. And it turned out that things that the conventional scanners could not distinguish, we could distinguish all of them. Now, that doesn't mean really that there is a false alarm rate of zero, because that really means that you have a functional system and you do lots of experiments on it. You never make a mistake. All that this statement says here is, is that um, we can resolve all of these false alarms and to uh, identify identically what these materials are. So in principle, this should significantly reduce the um, <coughs> false alarm rate and enable us to put more things in our bag that we can do today. And thirdly, where TSA is interested, they're worried about future threads, uh, which can uh, not be uh, detected by any of the technologies that we have. And so maybe this is a potential way of, of making that happen, particularly if you think of very low density fluids, for example. And then in the uh, um, DPC chest x-ray prototype, this is something that was uh, done in Germany. And um, so here, what you see on the upper right hand side is that um, this is the um, and chest x-ray, um, dark field and conventional x-ray. So the dark field is on the left-hand side, the conventional x-ray is on the right-hand side. And uh, so the patient is laying on a uh, sample bed and then there is a rotating x-ray source that essentially uh, scans uh, crosswise across the chest while the patient is being moved underneath it. And um, 
So this is kind of a standard uh, DPC uh, system that I described a bit earlier um, in terms of uh, how it is put together. And so what you have is in again G0, T1, and T2. And um, what you see here is in, in item number A, for example, um, there is a area, although you have to be kind of a trained technician in order to really find this. And, and the, the contrast seems to be a little bit less than that. And so the reason for it is, is because there is edema in the portion of the lung and um, that will then uh, reduce the amount of scatter that comes out of it. And that scatter is representative of the contrast and the structure of the lungs. It's extremely hard to do that on x-rays. So we did about a year ago when COVID started um, in the spring of last year, um, we did some work with um, the radiology uh, group in Stanford, and um, we took some uh, pictures from um, phantoms and others. And in principle, I think there is a good possibility to do that, but um, there's still quite a few issues. And one of them is the fact that um, because of the fact that you have this um, phase grading doesn't really absorb much, but the analyzer grading actually um, does absorb half the energy. So it means the dose that goes through the patient is going to be probably double as what you need in order to do the normal absorption. And that is a problem. And so um, that's something that would have to be worked out. And that's an area that we spent some time on, as I'll show you later. And there's also um, you know, some other areas in here where you can see that uh, the conventional um, images compared with the dark field. The dark field may provide um, something that um, is useful, and particularly because you get both of these um, images at the same time, as well as the, um, the face measurement. So medical applications, um, uh, uh, security uh, applications, I might benefit from uh, two-dimensional imaging. And there's also non-destructive testing, et cetera. So let's look a little bit more detail about how this all works and why this um, is an interesting technology, at least to pursue for a while. So if you look at a uh, meds object, we all know if we um, look at this from uh, a contrast uh, perspective, then um, what happened is, is if you had a web system, that particle um, or the x-rays that are coming in are going to be absorbed and they're going to be scattered. And um, so in general, the number of photons going in will be less than what, um, or what go out and will be less than what go in. And so we essentially can look at that from a perspective of what is the intensity absorption that took place in that medium. Now, at the same time, um, you know, when you think about x-rays, you think about uh, very short wavelengths, and you think about, um, you know, this is probably the closest approximation to geometrical optics that we have in optics, um, but it is not totally as so that they always um, move in an exact uh, straight line. So if you take a red object and where the index of refraction is a little bit different, normally if this was optics, then um, the actually refractive beam, the angle alpha would come down, not up. But the index for x-rays is n minus delta, uh, one minus delta. And so it is just the opposite direction. And so there is a small angle, um, which is on the order of microradian. So one part in 10 to the sixth. And then the last part of it is, is that when you have a microcone of scattered x-rays that are being generated by the material which has a um, physical structure that is many, many, many orders of magnitude larger than the wavelengths or the energy of the x-rays. And um, so that part of it essentially tends to um, reduce the contrast. So we have, as you can see on an easier, if you just kind of took that cartoon, um, then we can see um, a, a striped pattern um, then that interference pattern would essentially be deformed by a um, bottle. And so we have seen this in optics. So there's a phase uh, measurement there. And then when you have the scattering on top of the uh, other two effects, then the scattering itself tends to reduce the, um, the uh, contrast of the, of the gratings. So these are the three different areas. Now, Remember, this is ultra small angle scattering. This is not scattering like you would get if you had 
um, something that's a kind of lower diagram where essentially the nuclei uh, produce a pattern that um, is on the order of the wavelengths of light. And so you get very large angles uh, that are scattered from that object. This is a very, very small angle in the order of about microradians. Okay, a little bit of physics behind this and why this is interesting. So um, when you look at the index of a fraction, um, so as I said earlier, this is one minus delta plus I beta. So there's a real part in here that essentially is, as I said earlier, on the order of maybe 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight or so that we want to measure. And then there's just the traditional absorption part of it. So when you work this out and you look at the atomic form factors, um, as is indicated in here, you essentially have a density function. And, um, you take the Fourier transform of that, um, and then you essentially sum over all of the um, <clears throat> atoms in your medium, then use the classic uh, electron radius. What you find is, is that, um, in essence, um, there are two components to this, and one of them is, is essentially this delta, it's a function x, y, and z. Um, and then the, um, the wave number. And then we get an attenuation aspect that is each power i k zero beta, where beta is the absorption coefficient. Now, <clears throat> in its own right, um, you would say, okay, that's good, but why is that important? Well, um, when you look at uh, this in a little bit more in detail, what you find is that this real part of the index of a fraction, the delta, essentially it depends um, on these form factors and uh, you sum this over all of the elements in your measuring volume. And um, what you find out is that uh, delta is proportional to the, um, the density um, and um, delta is now proportional. You can then derive that uh, to e to the power minus two. So that's for the photoelectric part. And so what you now see is, is that delta if you do this a photoelectric case, you get uh, e to the minus four, and that's the um, that is the um, uh, absorption. Whereas delta is e to the power minus two. So if you actually go to high energies, um, you find that the absorption um, essentially the signal gives you much lower contrast than the delta, and the uh, energy levels that we work at is on the order of about uh, maybe. Uh, uh, 100 or 90 kV or so on average, but um, the spectrum goes all the way up to uh, roughly about 180 uh, kVp on the uh, source. Okay, so the basic message here is, is that phase would uh, essentially be um, most likely several orders of magnitude more sensitive in order to determine parameters about that material than the absorption co coefficient uh, alone. And that refers back to um, our experiments. So our experiments are allowing us to make measurements in one part in 10 to the eight, uh, in some cases 10 to the nine. So we have pretty good signal to noise ratio and we can distinguish them uh, both the real and imaginary part, even for these um, energy levels that we're using. Okay, so what about the refraction then? So the refraction is essentially just like you would know in optics, this is that you have a thin object and um, then there is a uh, phase change that occurs, which essentially is two pi uh, over lambda times n L. And uh, just like in the optical case. And so when you work out the little geometry there for alpha, then that is proportional to the energy or the wavelengths times the gradient in um, the phase. And um, so phi two and phi one, so you can essentially now work out as to what the, um, uh, angle is if you look at the uh, phase as indicated there, where phi2 is k0 delta times d, which is now at x plus delta x. And so for a linear material, that will be linear. And so I just need to take the gradient. So actually, what it turns out is, is that alpha is proportional to the gradient of the uh, phase. And so when you think about phase contrast imaging, it really isn't measuring the phase, but it's measuring the derivative of the phase. And then in the case of ultra small angle scattering, um, this is the dark field part. What happens there is you know, highly exaggerated in here, but if you have a material consisting out of a large number of uh, components, particles, 
Um, then what you get is very, very small angles because, you know, it goes to sensitive like lambda over the physical size. So uh, think about that as micro radians that have about the same ratio as the um, wavelengths um, to the physical size. So it's just like classical optics. And then you then um, add all of those up, then you can actually do a calculation of um, basis on, on the Fourier optics approach, um, or you can do it on a scattering approach. And so a uh, uh, former student of my uh, and uh, myself wrote a couple of papers in optics to press a few weeks ago. And um, so the um, ultra small angle x ray scattering uh, that we are looking at is essentially um, determined by. Um, how much of that scattering takes place in the material, and we can look at the distribution and uh, compare them um, as to what might happen to the medium. And so it's another independent measurement, uh, as I said, to those absorption phase and then um, scatter. Okay, how small are all of these things? Well, if you look at the X-ray wavelengths, is 100 um, <clears throat> uh, picometer to 10, and um, and this is typically uh, at about 100 keV or so. And, and so this is way, way smaller than uh, most objects that we are interested in. And um, <coughs> monochromatic um, X-rays um, can be used. Um, but the problem with this is that uh, then you have very large facilities. And so it's expensive. It is difficult to carry out these uh, experiments. Um, and so if you want to have spatial ecoherence, um, then you have to have very small sources or very long propagation distances. And how long? Well, look at that simple calculation here. If you have an X-ray source that has a size roughly equal to W and the distance L, um, then this uh, correlation length, the lateral coherence, um, is roughly lambda L over W. And so if you put in, say, 30 keV, and, um, and then for the wavelengths and the lengths and the coherence, then what you find is that it has to be less than 40 microns. Now, why is that important? Well, the big problem is this is that if you actually make these uh, sources very small and you still have to have enough energy to go through the um, either the check bag or the, the carry on bag, then um, you have a lot of heat to dissipate. And so it's difficult to do that. Most of the X ray sources have sizes that are on the order of millimeters, not microns. But um, if you want to work this out over these disks, and this is what you have to uh, uh, live with. And then finally, how do we do this? Well, um, you all know this, that if you have a periodic grating, um, let's say uh, bits of B0, um, then you can just do Fresnel propagation. And so you see that formula, that's the Fresnel propagation formula for an input field E of X prime and zero. So if you look at that and calculate the transmission function, then you have essentially a sum of uh, Fourier components as indicated. And so you can then calculate E of X and Z. And so you have a summation over all of these Fourier components. Um, and um, then there are the two factors of propagation and the phase. So um, if you want to have a pattern that repeats itself, um, then in essence, what you need to do is, is make that quantity lambda um, pi and c divided by p0 squared, which is up in the propagation quantity. Um, you have to make that an multiple of 2 pi. And so then you'd expect to get the repetition of the same pattern. And so if mt is essentially, um, <clears throat> or zt is then the, um, the distance over which you have to propagate to get the Talbot effect, then that is equal to p0 squared over lambda. So if I take a... Um, grading, which is now, for example, G1, and I have a period um, of uh, slots in there, then in essence, the way I think about this is, is that uh, if you take now these two transmitted areas and you add them up, then um, at the point where in between halfway in, you get constructive interference and the rest to the left and the right of it is destructive interference. If you now take those two as sources, then what you find is, is you're going to get, again, the constructive uh, interference. And so when you get to the plane Z and CT, you essentially have a copy of the grating that is at C0. And this is the geometrical relationship that you have to follow. And so what we do is, is we essentially place that um, interference pattern on the detector. And we can do that 
and to know P0 um, and we know the energy at which we're working, now we can calculate this. Now you may ask, you know, what energy are you using and what wavelengths? Because when you look at the source, it essentially gives you somewhere between 20 and 30 kV to maybe 150 kV, and it has a certain resonance lines in it, but it's a very broad band spectrum. And of course, everybody knows that if you actually superimpose um, the wavelengths that are different, then you're going to get uh, much less contrast on the interference pattern. So we did an analysis and Yuzuru did a lot of that um, to kind of determine what is the optimum wavelengths that you plug in where you design the grading for. And that turns out to be um, for these applications in the medical world and for security somewhere in the order for about 90 kV. And so what you do is, is you plug in the energy for 90 kV and you essentially um, can calculate from the geometrical factors that I saw, talked about earlier, then what P0 should be, and then I can calculate what ZT is. And that essentially then sets the geometry of the uh, system. Finally, how do we analyze the signals? So just take the case again of a face object uh, on the left-hand side, that face object then produces a um, diffracted angle. And so now, <clears throat> what I get is a interference pattern. When I look at that interference pattern, um, if I now find out what, the, uh, if I want to find the detail of this, what you can see here is, is that um, there's a problem. And the problem is, is that my pixels typically on these detectors are also um, in maybe fractions of a millimeter or at least hundreds of microns. Um, so the problem becomes now that I cannot measure that phase function anymore. But if I take a grating that actually has the same um, period as the interference pattern, then I can move this grating. And then as a function of time, as I scan across um, the interference pattern, um, I can then measure the intensity on the detector. And what I get is a signal that I see on the right-hand side. So, First, we make a measurement without an object, so that's the blue line. And then we make a measurement with the object, and that's the red line. And so from these measurements, so having done the calibration, which is the blue line, and then do the red one, but I do all of this by moving the grating, then I get a measurement of um, the uh, phase contrast signal, which is essentially just um, v objective minus V reference. And so I can get that by looking at where the minima or the maxima have moved to. So that's delta V. The second part is the dark signal that is essentially just visibility for the object in the reference case. And so that gives me the, the um, essentially the visibility of the fringes. And then the third one, the standard absorption is essentially associated um, with how much the signal has moved from here to here. So by making one set of data uh, for a, an experiment, then I can essentially calculate both the real part, the imaginary part, and the dark signal. And so what I have is an alpha is, again, as I said before, proportional to the gradient of the phase times lambda over 2 pi. So one measurement, three results. What's the problem? Well, the problem is this, <clears throat> that if I take a high contrast grating, and I have x-rays coming in here, just think about it geometrically, these rays are essentially going through a uh, alley. And as a result, there's a very small field of view. So this fault of view is on the order of maybe a few uh, centimeters or so. And so this is about uh, nine and a half microns. And um, this angle here is about five degrees. And so what you get is, is if you take this geometry that we're using, is that the object field of view is roughly 6.2 millimeter centimeters, which is really way too small for any practical purpose. So you need to make this grading curved. And if you can't make the grading large enough, then you have to essentially um, make them in a uh, integrated form where we essentially have a large number of these gratings which are patched together. Now, and Yuzuru was there, um, we started thinking about this in a very different way. And, and the question was, how could you make something that um, didn't have all of these drawbacks of both the amount of energy that is lost in the gratings, and secondly, that um, you have moving parts. And uh, so for a rotating gantry, this is very difficult to do. 
And um, so um, essentially you have an interferometer where you have to have everything stable to one part in 10 to the seventh or 10 to the eighth, and it's rotating. That's a big issue. So, <coughs> sorry. The um, <coughs> system that we came up with is a, um, a photoelectron X-ray source array. So the thought was, well, what if you actually created a source that did not have a, um, uh, a square or a round cross section, but essentially had already the stripes that we want. So if you had a photocathode and you could illuminate the photocathode with a um, spatial light modulator, and uh, that then would produce a um, patterned uh, electron beam. That pattern electron beam can then, through a magnetic field, be imaged onto the anode. And um, then essentially, you're going to get a pattern of um, X rays that have already that grading form. The other interesting thing about this is, is that um, since this is a laser and you have a DMD here, for example, you very quickly you can move the grading. So you can actually move the X rays. Um, without having to deal with moving it on the detector because it's the equivalent of moving on the detector. So that's one thing that would be pretty interesting to do. And the other part is, uh, and this is an area that Yuzuru worked on, is when you have a pick that is essentially a, a, um, now an array of detectors. And so the basic thought is we started optics, converted into electrons, converted into X-rays, and the X-rays now go into a scintillator and then there is a telecentric micro lens array. And then there's a face coded aperture in here. And then we have a pattern mask. And what comes out of it again is um, an electrical signal or an optical signal. So now what we have is optics to optics. In between, we go from electrons to X rays and then back. So we built um, a complicated system. Um, so this is essentially a power supply. It's good up to about 100 kV. And so he has a, uh, a curved uh, copper insulated wire. And uh, then there is a ceramic insulator. And the parent lays the beam incident onto the um, cathode. <clears throat> then we get onto um, and, and the anode. Uh, creates a pattern pass, which then um, goes into um, the uh, tungsten target, and what comes out is a pattern set of X-rays. And now the field of view is about 27 degrees, which is um, really what we want. It uh, has to be somewhere between 25 and 35. So um, this is a very complicated system. However, we went to um, uh, <coughs> Comac, which is a manufacturer of X-rays, and um, they thought that they actually could build this into an X-ray source. Um, if the demand was large enough uh, for it to the, modify their uh, production uh, system. And so what you see here on the top is just the basic system. If you take lasers and, and you have a material, I'll show you what they are, then you produce an electron beam, which you then can image. And now you have essentially an equivalent pattern that is incident on the tungsten target. Um, so now I can produce X-rays. So how do you do that? Well, one way we did this and we developed this uh, uh, photocathode, cesium bromide or cesium iodine, uh, and they put it onto a metal substrate. And uh, then you um, do E-beam bombardment. So essentially used as a source of electrons. And the electrons then essentially um, uh, activate this material. Then you illuminate them with for five nanometers, so a blue uh, laser diode. and um, <clears throat> Then if we have, um, and, and what comes out uh, is a set of electrons. We can further um, enhance that by doing electron bombardment for a certain time in the same location. And what you get uh, then is a, uh, an amplification. And so you can rejuvenate this material, um, even though the electrons are emitted from it. And these are kind of uh, on a daily basis or so, uh, you would have to do that. but. Um, it is a, a very efficient way of creating uh, an electron source, and it's done under optics illumination as opposed to electrical uh, applied fields. And so here, what you see is, is some uh, G0 pattern that is on the cathode. So this is on the source side, and this is on the anode. And uh, so there's a small rotation in here due to the field, but um, we can fix that by just uh, changing and rotating the input. And so these are actual physical measurements that then produce X-rays. <clears throat> 
the last thing I want to talk about is, um, <clears throat> well, the detector that um, Yuzuru and others worked on, we never got this to the point that it was actually becoming a, a, a real a physical system that we could test. There were some maybe one inch by one inch um, type of um, prototype uh, subsystem that we could test out the basic configuration, but the numerical aperture was quite small and so sort of quite a bit more work needs to be done. So one of the students who was involved in this, um, George Harris, and I talked about this, um, and this has been kind of a dream for me when I was at Caltech. I remember taking some courses from um, Nick George, and um, he was discussing about how you potentially could write a X-ray hologram, um, but it had not been done and in a practical way. So one thing that occurred to me was this. When you look at this, this looked like a, a grating. And the spacing is on the order of about a few microns or so. So um, the question that um, I, I asked myself was, um, what would happen if you actually take that intensity pattern of x-rays and um, you essentially uh, put it onto a lithium ibic? Well, that's going to look just like a um, grading. And so you know Ray knows all about this. So what you essentially now get is a a variation in the index that is based on the um, X-rays that are being um, illuminated, uh, illuminating the lithium ion. And so um, X-rays have enough energy that you actually can go from the, uh, uh, the valence band to the conduction band without having to, um, to put any dopants in it. So if you do this in the optical domain and you write into lithium ion, which we did for holographic storage, then you have to put in iron or some other intermediate um, uh, energy level. And the reason for that is that, that the, the band gap is somewhere around eight or nine uh, or so EV. So um, you can do that with light. Um, but with x trace, you can. And so now what you do is just say, all you need to make is just a um, face grading. In this case, we use the point source. And uh, now what we got this is to say uh, uh, diffracted x rays from the object. And uh, they produce a slightly modified from the plane wave interferometry type of uh, hologram, a modified hologram that contains the information about the object. And then from the opposite side, you take a readout beam. And so this readout beam now comes out and there is a diffracted beam and the transmitted wave. You then change the phase and the amplitude so that you essentially superimpose only the signal with a small reference. And then what you get is essentially an imaging lens that then produces a CMOS image of that diffraction pattern. If you know the shape of the diffraction pattern, you can then read out just like you do in optical uh, interferometry, um, what the phase is along the pass length. And so if you do an CT, you can actually uh, do a 3D reconstruction. So George for his thesis essentially built this configuration and we demonstrated that this could be done and this published um, a, um, a while ago in applied physics letters. Um, it's still a long ways away from making that a um, commercial product and there was never our purpose. But the interesting thing is, is that um, when you go back a little bit, um, let me see if I can get that uh, quickly um, <clears throat> because this is something that um, we haven't really spoken much about, but it is an important issue. Uh, just a second here. Let me get back to the setup. Um, okay. <clears throat> These gratings have to be all lined up to a fraction of the, um, the spacing or the grating uh, vector. And the reason for that is, is that if you actually um, rotate this along the propagation axis, so it's uh, thinking about this in the Z direction and the gratings are rotate a little bit, you've got a problem because you can't read out the gratings anymore. And so when you make the measurements then with the G2 from the interference pattern, um, that won't work. So the alignment in the X and Y direction, so perpendicular to the grade and parallel to the grading vector, perpendicular to the grading and in the direction of um, propagation, that's not too difficult and up and down also is not too difficult that is more practical, but rotation along the propagation direction is a real issue. And so 
this the last um, slide that I was going to discuss, um, that problem actually goes away. And so um, in this case, um, and it goes also away in terms of um, with respect to the PEXA, because you can rotate that as well. But if you didn't have PEXA, you have this system where you essentially would have G0 that is fixed. This hologram can be recorded in any kind of orientation. You'd like to have it in the direction of the C axis for the um, lithium iodate, um, but it is self aligning. So that makes the practical system a lot more. Um, the other part of it is, is that um, <clears throat> it turns out that in conventional um, X-ray detectors, you might ask, why don't we make, um, you know, like a few micron size uh, pixels and um, for X-rays as we do in the optical realm. So we have very high resolution cameras and high efficiency. Well, unfortunately that doesn't work out. In the X-ray case, what happens is, is that since you have a scintillator in there, you're either going to have high efficiency and then very large, uh, but small signals, so large pixels. So you're going to get very small pixels, but very low efficiency. And this design in here, and since you have a light beam that can amplify the signal, you essentially can have one to two orders of magnitude higher efficiency, quantum efficiency, while at the same time also having a resolution on the order of microns, um, which is you know, several orders of magnitude smaller than what um, you can do with conventional uh, detectors. So um, this has been uh, our adventure in different Rancho phase contrast imaging. And um, so given the original system where we started from, we um, did a lot of uh, original technology development. Um, some of these are shown here. We have curved gratings with 100 to 1 contrast where um, the grating spacing is in the order of about two microns or so, two to three microns. Then the PEXA source, um, you know, the patent X-ray source, then PECDA um, that USU uh, worked on and, and showed the proof of principle. And then the holographic detector, which requires no alignment and um, can even order of magnitude or more uh, higher quantum efficiency with very high resolution micron size. And so we think that this is a um, interesting technology that could potentially be used for aviation security scanners, um, but the next step would be to build one and test it out. Uh, the same is already uh, happening with medical imaging. I know that Siemens and uh, Philips are both working on this. Uh, then there is non-destructive testing. We um, can use this for doing, for example, inspection of uh, printed parts. Uh, and uh, there again, phase and amplitude and scatter are very helpful. Um, and then there is food inspection. We have a small contract from the um, Drug and <coughs> Administration Food Inspection uh, to kind of look at this for looking at rice and, and fruits coming into the US, how they could actually be measured using phase contrast and, uh, and, and there's uh, better results than what you do with absorption, which is a technique that we use today. So um, thank you for your uh, attention and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to give a talk here. And I all look forward to um, hopefully visiting you and then uh, the university uh, in person next year. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Bert. Yeah. So this is a amazing, a you know, combination of multi-scale wavelengths and systems, and very complex. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, great. And uh, now let's take uh, any questions uh, uh, from audiences. Uh, if you have any, okay. Uh, hold on. I'm gonna give you a mic. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, can we carry out phase contrast imaging using incoherent light sources? Well, the source is incoherent, but you make it partially coherent by having a grating. So um, let me just see this here. So the way you can think about this is that um, <clears throat> If you take this incoherent source here, so it essentially is just a either rectangular or circular uh, spot size, then when it passes through this grating, then what you essentially have is a set of linear 
sources. So um, the gold itself absorbs um, like <clears throat> a significant amount, ideally 100% of the x-rays. And then in between, you let the x-rays go through. And uh, so what you now have is essentially small sources that have a certain uh, spatial coherence. And so then um, you can calculate what a transmission function is for this um, G0. And what you find out then is, is that is the equivalent as if you had a small source, but it's now a one dimensional uh, source. And then you can calculate what the resultant um, spatial coherence is as a function of propagation. So there is essentially some increase in the spatial coherence when you propagate, and this is essentially just due to statistical optics. And um, so you can look at the mutual coherence function. Um, but the basic idea is just that the grading turns the broad source into a series of small slits. And those slits then produce, um, together with the, the phase grading, um, a, a Talbot intensity pattern that falls under detector. So that's what the idea is here. If you had enough uh, small sources, and as I said, there are some ways of dealing with this. Um, the big issue is, is, is uh, one that um, was the same as for the uh, Cray supercomputer. The first one that came out had, I think, only one or two patents on it, and they were associated with cooling. There was a huge amount of heat that was being generated. Um, here is the same thing. If you actually um, would make the source small, but you need to have the flux large enough to penetrate an absorbing medium, particularly if there is like metal involved, um, then the, uh, uh, there is no uh, known solution for that if you use a solid material. On the other hand, there are some X-ray sources that essentially have a series of droplet things about this as, as an X, as a uh, inkjet printer, um, and then you essentially um, use those as the um, you know, medium that uh, converts the electrons incident into it into x-rays. Thank you so much. Hey, Ray. Yeah. So, hey, Bert. So what sort of uh, resolution and field of view do you think you'd be able to get with this? So our field of view um, was um, designed for um, 60 centimeters by uh, 40 centimeters high. So it's essentially like a, um, a good size um, uh, checked in bag. Ultimately, we designed it for the complete uh, one. And so the resolution itself is on the order of um, in the fractions of a millimeter or something like that. Um, and so what we found out was that uh, there's, there's several things that the TSA is worried about. Um, you know, th this is not secret. In fact, we don't do secret work, but um, very thin materials. So when you have essentially these plastic explosives that are very thin, you remember what happened here you know, that flight uh, around Christmas a uh, number of years ago from Paris to the US, where we had the, um, the bomber that had it in his shoe. And um, so it's very difficult to detect that. And so we showed that we could actually measure uh, very thin uh, sheets of paper in a book. And uh, so since you can measure the face, then you could use that to determine whether or not this was a close material. And, um, and then the, uh, so this, that size is a, is, is a big issue. And, um, but the resolution is ultimately determined by the detector and the detector, uh, there's a little bit of geometry as you can imagine. So um, since it is a di diverging cone beam, um, you're gonna get this geometrical effect of, of um, um, the size being smaller by the ratio of the distances from the source to the object and object to the uh, detector. But typically it's like, um, currently the detector is like three millimeters in size. Um, the ones that we used were higher resolution. I think the holographic one would be the ultimate one that would essentially have resolutions of few microns. Yeah. I personally think that that was an incredibly interesting project that uh, George worked on because um, oh, for me, it kind of makes a full circle to go from optics to x-rays and back to optics. And, um, but the uh, interesting part is, is that uh, you could have um, orders of magnitude more 
efficiency. And so, and at the same time, high resolution. And whereas currently that, that trade-off just does not work. And uh, so you have a curve that looks like this, where you have resolution and then you have quantum efficiency. And so you're either in that course where you have very little resolution or you're up in here and then you have very little um, quantum efficiency. So this system could have both and that could have a lot of impact in, in both medical applications as well as uh, yeah. recording. Now, one last comment about that in the TSA case, there is something else though. The fact that you actually can still take liquid with you on board um, means that they're not worried about that. And the reason for this is below a certain threshold, um, you don't blow up the plane. So you might get some explosion, but you don't blow it up. And so they have set these, these numbers as to what you can work with uh, at certain levels. And um, I'm really not privy what all of that is, but um, it takes a certain amount of energy to um, to uh, cause an impact, and so in that sense, uh, small amounts you can probably tolerate. Uh, but then it gets a certain size, um, then you definitely get a flag that goes up and says, you know, whatever the substance is, we do not allow it. Yeah, sounds great, Bert. Thanks. <clears throat> Welcome. Okay. Um, is there any other questions or anything? Hey, Bart, um, I have one question. Um, Good. Let's see. Yeah, uh, how long does it take to expose lithium niobate uh, in a system? So what's the exposure time at typically, typically uh, in the order of seconds or minutes? I'm just curious about it. No, the second is very fast. Um, oh, you wow. know, yeah. And yeah, because you know the, the energy level is high, right? Um, so um, and I asked that question, but uh, we think that we can go to um, on the order of about nanoseconds response time. And mm -hmm. the reason for this is because it's really an electronic um, response of the medium. You essentially go from the uh, uh, valence to the conduction band. And so this is an energy transport. And um, so in lithium niobate, there have been experiments done um, this X-rays to uh, determine the response. And uh, that's on the order of nanoseconds. Uh, now, the question is, you know, can you do that? Um, and um, um, this case, we're using undoped lithium niobate mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's no benefit in using uh, dope material. So it's totally right. transparent. And um, that also helps uh, sufficiently in terms of the readout because you don't get absorption in the readout wavelengths either, very little. And um, so it's only phase that is, is changing. So it's really a phase grading as opposed mm -hmm. to a phase hologram as opposed to an absorption hologram. So the efficiency of the readout should also be very high. And, um, and, uh, but, but the electronic transport that happens, um, so you essentially create vacancies and, uh, mm -hmm. and <laughs> electron hole pairs, um, that happens on the orders of sub nanoseconds. And so um, we haven't demonstrated that, but um, it's kind of interesting because you know, a lot of the things you learn in optics um, are different in x-rays, even though it's also optics, right? So the, the index of refraction is just the opposite. And, um, and you get the behavior is the, the, the different. Um, but when you look at it in terms of the x-rays, the amount of energy is so high um, and the wavelengths is so short that you still can get a large phase difference in different areas of the optic, for example, more than two pi. Uh, and, and we do find that regularly. And that's only because the wavelengths are so short. So you essentially, when you calculate delta phi, you have to take that delta n times the distance divided by the wavelengths. And so that number is very, very large because the wavelength is so short. So as a result, you get a large phase change. So, um, but yeah, that's roughly what, what the numbers are as well. All right, thank you very much. And uh, you know, we can erase rating for the next measurement, right? As far as using lithium niobate, which is also Great, I think. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, so, any other questions for Professor Hesserink? No. All right. Masood. Fine. All right. So then, uh, thank you very much, Brad. Um, you know, for your giving lecture, and uh, we enjoyed a lot. And hope you know we have you in person um, next time in Arizona. So we are looking forward to see you in person in Arizona shortly. All right. Thank you very much. And that is thanks, Bert, again.
Yeah, <laughs> thank you all. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you about this research. And thank you, Zuru, for all the great contributions you have made to the program. And um, I yeah, very much look forward to seeing uh, you all in person next year. And in the meantime, I wish you all a very uh, good Christmas or holiday season. You too, Brad. And uh, yeah, enjoy nice weather in California, uh, in Lake Tahoe. All right. <laughs> See you again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and Ray, send me a message. We'll talk on the Zoom line. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.